My name is Jennifer Ackerman, and I'm an associate professor in the School of Architecture and a member of the college's lecture and exhibits uh, committee. And I am so glad you can join us for this talk by tonight's guest, Mitch McEwen. As we start, I wanted to take a moment to thank the College of Architecture and Design and the Robert B. Church III Memorial Lecture Endowment for making this college lecture series possible. I also wanna thank my colleagues on the Lectures and Exhibitions Committee for their hard work in planning and running the series this year. And I also wanted to thank um, Jeff Wilkerson, Amanda Johnson, and Jenny Flatford, who've put in an enormous amount of work uh, to make all of the technical logistics work, um, all of which helps these events to thrive. We all work to invite exciting people who work throughout the architecture and design disciplines and who offer many different examples of the way design matters in the world. And tonight's speaker is no exception to that. It is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's lecturer, Dee Mitch McEwen, and to welcome her virtually to the University of Tennessee. Mitch McEwen is an assistant professor at Princeton University, where she directs the architecture and technology research group, Black Box. She previously taught at the University of Michigan's Talman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from, of Economics from Harvard University and a Master of Architecture degree from Columbia University. With Amina Blackshire, Mitch is the co-founder of Atelier Office, a design practice that serves the public by advising clients who, share sparing, sharing, who value sharing space with others, excuse me. Professor McEwen is also the founder of the Brooklyn-based nonprofit Superfront. To me, Professor McEwen's work, both in practice and in her teaching, is an extraordinary example of critical pra practice, seeking to expand how architecture can infuse our daily life. Her work ranges from performance to wearable constructs, to urban installations, to buildings. One of the things I admire about her practice is how it's tactical in engaging clients early in the design process, sometimes advising them about things that lay the groundwork for architecture to be possible, like applying for grants or choosing the best site. Her practice also helps clients share in her high expectations for what design can do. The work blends high-tech and low-tech fabrication techniques as it blends academic theory with popular culture. The firm's work engages complex social questions, including how to attack fundamental challenges of racism and inequity. They are extraordinary architectural designers, yet they also seek to push beyond architecture, seeking to, quote, expand the map of what's probable and possible. And we are so happy to have the chance to hear this talk tonight. Before turning it over, I want to encourage everyone watching to think of questions and ideas raised by Professor McEwen's lecture. And you can submit your questions through the Q&A chat window at any time. I'll share them with Mitch at the end of the talk for her thoughts and for further discussion. Please help me welcome Professor Mitch McEwen. All right, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, thank you, thank you to the, the University of Tennessee um, I have not been to Tennessee in person, so this, this is my first vi virtual visit to Tennessee. Um, I, I hope to, to be there in person at some point. Um, the, I'm calling this talk Hapticality or Love, parentheses architecture from the undercommons. I'm going to start sharing screen in a minute, um, but I just want to make it clear that this is a phrase I'm borrowing from um, Fred Moten and, and Steve Harney uh, in their book, The Undercommons. Uh, so I'm going to start a screen share and just um, jump into the lecture here. There's going to be some sound, there's going to be some videos, so get yourself ready for that. Um, you'll, you'll have some, some time to get your, your sound set up ready. We don't, I'm not starting immediately with, with videos. Um, so to, to talk about hapticality, it's, it's a way of talking about logistics. And, and I guess before I get into, um, there's, I'm gonna break this down into a few different subsets. But before I get into that, I think um, I'm gonna give a talk that's fairly theoretical, but I'm gonna link it to my work and to some ideas. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a talk the same way I would at Princeton or the same way I would anywhere. Um, but I'm, I'm honing into logistics and I'm gonna talk why I think that's important where you are at University of Tennessee. Um, to talk about logistics. And I just want to say that, that I've never lived in the South. 
I've lived in California, I've lived in the Midwest, I grew up in DC, I lived in New England. And for me, one of the things that's important about theory is it gives us a way of relating outside of our own personal experience. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna start this with W.B. Du Bois um, with the notion of data and data portraits. Um, the phrase hapticality or love is borrowed from a subchapter in Fred Moten in Steve Harney's radical free book, The Undercommons, Fugitive Planning in Black Study. The phrase appears in the chapter titled Fantasy in the Hold. When we look at something like this, um, W.B. Du Bois was a sociologist, but I, I think he also was a designer. I know he also was a science fiction writer. Um, he imagined new technologies. Um, we don't often think of fantasy. And one of the, the notions that I'm gonna put on the table today is that if we are interested in architecture's progressive capacities, we do not have to give up the imaginary. We don't even have to um, move ourselves over outside of our own discipline to embrace a concept like justice. And I know that that is something that uh, there's there's a, a, a movement right now in architecture, and I and I and I respect a lot of the folks who are doing work around justice in architecture. What I'm going to put on the table today is something different, and it, and it's the relationship between logistics and fantasy. Um, so to go back to the the text that I'm, I'm orienting this this notion of um, hapticality in in the undercommons. This is a chapter I've turned to repeatedly over the past few years as I have grappled with the understanding of architecture as it once the hold, the container, the logistics that makes subjects into bodies and subsumes systems into profit, and also the fantasy in the hold. I glommed onto this notion in some ways because it explains an orientation to computation as well. Computation does not map neatly onto either fantasy or the logistics of the hold. Computation mediates and propels both. In this data portrait by Du Bois, um, you're looking at population, you're looking at statistics, but you're also looking at that propulsion off the page. You're looking at a, a kind of a spring. You're looking at a kind of speculation of what it is that a, a black rural population might do in America, right? Thinking about the turn of the 19th century and how that, that energy of, of black people might move out of the South or might move the South, might move that, that rurality into something else. Um, so I'm gonna break this talk down and to logistics, containers, and finances. Um, and, then, and then something I'm working on that I'm calling Black Algorithmic Thought. And then these other terms are also borrowed from, from Moten, um, the field, constant recombination, and, and, and let's go. Obviously, these are attitudes. Moten and Harney ask, where did logistics get this ambition to connect bodies, objects, affects, information without subjects, without the formality of subjects, as if it could reign sovereign over the informal, the concrete and generative indeterminacy of material life? The truth is modern logistics was born that way. And so with logistics, I noticed at your university, University of Tennessee, 8% of graduates are graduating with a major in logistics, right? Here at this university, you know something about logistics, specifically logistics, materials, and supply chain management, right? So that's 8% of the graduates studying this. This is where I wanna focus this evening, right? There are politics in these logistics, materials, and supply chains being managed. There are also fantasies there. I think it is here in this hapticality, the touch of materials in the midst of logistics, the feeling in the midst of management that we can locate in architecture otherwise an architecture that participates in another world that is possible. So with that, now I'm gonna to transition to my work. Uh, I'm gonna start with uh, a sort of data portrait of the entire country and then, and, and then kind of shift scales as I go through these, these subtopics. Uh, this is a data portrait that, uh, you know, obviously uh, we're, we're in the midst of the, 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 the season that we participate in our democracy. I hope everyone has voted. And if you haven't, I hope you're voting tomorrow, please do. And um, so this is a, a data portrait that I did um, in the past few weeks um, that is basically, it's, it's water and courthouses. Um, and, and, it's, and it's a way, it's sort of my um, roundabout way of, of putting this question of justice in a visual way. Um, and, and, and basically what I'm, what I'm talking about with justice um, here, um, 
this kind of this kind of data portrait of the U.S. Um, the the way that I, I would situate this is in relationship to civil rights and its metaphors, right? So Martin Luther King says we cannot be satisfied so long as the Negro in Mississippi cannot vote, and the Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, we are not satisfied, and will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream, right? Martin Luther King said in 1963. What's mapped here is impaired waters registered for restoration with the EPA. That's what you're seeing in blue. And courthouses are, are the dots. Um, and so, in a way, obviously, the, the metaphors that, that, we, that, that political movements need are often evoking landscapes. They're, they're often evoking the built environment um, in a way that's different than, than those of us who are grappling um, with waterways um, um, in terms of combined sewer overflow and some of the things that I'm going to show in my work, it's a different way, right? We're, we're not dealing with the metaphors, we're dealing with, with the impairments on the ground. And that's where I think this, um, this question of logistics and fantasy can actually work together. So one of, uh, it, this is, and I'm going to dive into some of my projects in the Midwest. Um, this is the Great Lakes region, and what you're looking at now is, is Michigan. Um, and so one of the things that I've dealt with in, in my work in Detroit um, is the logistics of water and something that I call watercraft. Um, and where this came up in, in my work, I'm gonna show you a neighborhood design project that I did for the city of Detroit, but also maps that I was doing in a speculative way uh, for, for, for research to understand this paradox of how it is that this city that's surrounded by the, the largest fresh water resource um, on the planet could also be a place where um, water was pushing people out of their homes. It was pushing pe people out of their homes in a material way through combined sewer overflow and flooded basements. And it was pushing people out of their homes um, through the, 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 the politics of managing water in terms of water bills that were um, often higher than the value of people's houses. And so what I started mapping was the relationship between Detroit and the suburbs. And something that um, I, it was not evident to me until I started to map it was the extent to which the suburbs depended upon the city of Detroit um, through centralized infrastructure. Um, one of the largest wastewater treatment plants in the world, rivaled only by one, a new one in Saudi Arabia and a large one in Mexico City, um, is right there in the orange circle on this, on this map. And then what you're seeing here is just kind of sprawling out to the suburbs of, um, uh, basically I started to, to overlay because there was no, um, what you're looking at obviously is GIS, geographical information, um, uh, systems which are a kind of logistics, right? The way that we manage the, the kind of spatial data is a kind of logistics. That I started to overlay pavement and sewer lines and to understand the extent to which um, sewered areas were branching out from this central infrastructure. So that what was being um, priced in Detroit as water bills was actually a subsidy for the, the sewer ridge that extended to the suburbs. This is something that I was able to, um, it, it sort of came out of work that I did for the Venice Biennale in 2016, where the site for the US Pavilion was Detroit. Um, I've been dealing with Detroit as I was living in Detroit and I was um, really fascinated with the ways that Detroit is a border city. Um, so what you're looking at here for this Vien Venice Biennale project, um, is the border to Canada, which is now a, a, a huge bridge, an international bridge is being constructed um, with Canadian financing because this, this country wouldn't pay for that level of infrastructure. And what I dealt with in this project um, for the Venice Biennale in 2016 was thinking about logistics from the perspective of those who live in the neighborhood where this international traffic of goods um, in, in the current reality just kind of passes by them, right? So um, this is Southwest Detroit. And the way that the logistics hit the ground here was that the largest transfer of goods between the United States and, and Canada over land basically happens over um, this, this existing bridge here. And that means trucks, which means um, air pollution, which means asthma rates. And the jobs and the benefits accrued elsewhere. So I started to wonder what if an architecture could participate in this new border infrastructure that would radically reimagine, that would kind of overlay this logistics 
um, with a kind of fantasy, a kind of speculation around remediating the air. Um, so, so that project then in, in, that, in that triangle of this train yard then starts to reimagine how the goods themselves could circulate, starts to reimagine rather than trucking over bridges and land that perhaps this new bridge could participate in the freight rail infrastructure, that perhaps uh, freight could be the place for some of this international exchange of goods. Obviously, there's a lot of automobiles crossing the, the border, right, for as products. Um, but but that even even rather than this kind of cycle of the sale of automobiles and the manufacturing of automobiles always perpetuating more automotive infrastructure, that 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 cycle might be transformed into something else with a kind of freight rail, and that and that the infrastructure that opened up could actually then because we get rid of the trucks combine housing and this kind of heavy exchange of goods at the same time that an infrastructure for remediating the air populated um, some of the, um, the, the, the large floor plate for this exchange of goods. So it really starts to think um, manufacturing, logistics. Um, I think, you know, the, the architecture, obviously it's, it's speculative, it's, it's, it was for an, an exhibition, um, but the, 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 for, the formalism here is in service of this relationship between logistics and fantasy, um, that we might think of um, collapsing um, problems of, of air quality, inequality, um, um, low-income housing, and, and climate change, um, rather than trying to deal with them as, um, as, as a kind of separate um, layers of problem solving that we, that we might actually sort of collapse them into a, a question of, of speculation that would imagine the, the remediation participating in a kind of excess. Um, so, so everything um, in the architecture is concerned here with air purification. Even, even the, the systems for the, the housing are based upon a pneumatic uh, concrete. So Detroit is um, a place where the, 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 the city, the narrative of the city kind of got taken over by logistics in some ways in the sense that demolition started to define uh, Detroit more than construction. Um, and so I, I got really concerned with sort of mapping and understanding this sort of erasure of the built environment in Detroit. And, and, what, and what, I, what I started to work on there was a sort of pattern recognition in the city. Um, and so architecture then, the scale of the building um, started to have a kind of logistical relationship in my work with um, this urban wide pattern of demolition, specifically through the balloon frame house. Um, and so what, what, what I started to map was um, basically again, sort of really getting into the, 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 the data of, of the city in terms of GIS, um, you can locate not only building footprints, but the year of construction. And so I started to call out effectively um, certain time periods of construction where the balloon frame house was the predominant mode of construction. And the reason for doing that was um, basically to have something like a repeatable set of operations that architecture could do. Um, so I only, so this is not repeated yet. I'm gonna show you one project uh, on a balloon frame house in Detroit. But the ambition of, of this project was really that it would have a logistical um, sort of, if not afterlife, logistical repercussions in the sense that it, the, the balloon frame can, as it's already proliferated throughout Detroit, I, I estimated there are about 60,000 vacant houses, at least as of a couple years ago, and of those 60,000, about 10,000 are, are structurally similar to this house. So what I'm going to show you could be repeated across thousands of houses. Um, and, and, you know, to, to, again, this question of sort of not just buildings as containers, but um, this question of finance, part of what, um, this is a project called House Opera that I'm now showing you in Detroit, um, part of what was at stake was also the question of, of property in terms of how property circulates um, is not only a material fact, 
um, but also a, a financial one. And so one of the, the sort of patterns in the, the vacancies in these houses in Detroit um, was the relationship between tax liens and, and, and the, the vacancy. And so um, this, this project was possible as a self-initiated project because the auctions um, sold these houses for, uh, at the time, $1,200, $1,500 um, for the purposes of, of back taxes and tax delinquency. But that's in a way sort of, you know, part of, of the, the, the logistics that the project is, is seeking to, to have some uh, impact on. Um, actually, I just got contact from someone who is interested in moving back to this neighborhood and, and wants to uh, learn from the operations on this house to understand how now a, a residential house can be built where um, currently, as you'll see, it's a, it's a space for, for arts and performance. So in a way, uh, in a very slow way, the, this project is, is starting to circulate as, as logistics. Um, and so the house opera was very much inspired by Detroit, um, by the ways in which Detroit has invented music and invented performance formats. Uh, of course, Detroit is, is known um, for producing Motown, but um, Detroit also invented techno. And I, I was more sort of um, interested in the, the, the relationship between techno and experimentation um, in terms of digital experimentation and also this relationship to sort of avant-garde jazz. And so opera then became a rubric to sort of think about um, how this house could become a public space, a public space that we might think of as having a stage, a proscenium, um, uh, you know, even, even a, a place for uh, a kind of a, a balcony and for an audience to participate on the lawn. And the, the way that logistics entered in the architectural scale was that the, the sort of rule that we set up um, to make this repeatable was that as much as possible, no new materials would be added, that, that the architecture would really depend primarily upon labor and subtraction. Um, and so, so then the only material really is paper, it's building paper. Um, building paper, then Tyvek is, is part of what, what holds um, the sort of fantasy um, there. And, and this then projection of uh, a, a, a formalism onto just the kind of thin paper uh, is combined with this kind of drama that's possible when walls are cut out and floors are cut out. And, and that's, it's possible and repeatable in terms of the balloon frame because if you know balloon frame construction, you've got these long members um, so that instead of stacking floors, the floor is slotted into the walls effectively, right? So we could cut out the floor without, um, without that, that second level uh, collapsing. And obviously we did have to do some, we did have to, you know, sister um, the, the studs that were there. And, and you know, it, it was a bit of a conceit that we didn't add anything. There, there were some structural members to add, but, but very light. And, and effectively, what we did was then we, we partnered with, and this was with um, Marcelo Lopez de Narde, my, my design partner at the time. Uh, this was before an office merged to become Atelier office. And, and effectively, this became a space, a uh, public space, a civic space, an art space. Um, so rather than the vacant house uh, sort of bemoaning its failure to serve a kind of domestic reality, um, the, the, the building as container um, with these, uh, another set of logistics applied to it could operate in the public sphere. Um, so, so where these houses uh, kind of circulate in the public uh, at, at the time was primarily just on a balance sheet in terms of nonprofits moving them around between the city and the land bank. And the ambition was actually to kind of learn from that and say, okay, if these houses can, can circulate through a land bank in a kind of public way, how can they circulate in space publicly? How can they, how can they serve the neighborhood? And, and so there was um, not a clear way that this would repeat or um, not, there wasn't a, a permanent program that sort of slotted into this. So the, the paper sort of fell off and removed it and it's been through various stages of kind of stripping it down. Um, but I'm gonna show you a video to get the feel of it. Um,
just to, to hone in on this question of hapticality. Moulton and Harney present hapticality as a sense of the undercommons, a way of feeling for others, a feel for feeling others, feeling you. So beyond logistics, I am going to show you techniques, experiments, and projects that I'm grouping into five aspects of hapticality as I'm understanding haptics from Moulton and the undercommons. So these are logistics, black algorithmic thought, the feel, constant recombination, and let's go. You will notice that these are not types or hierarchical classifications. The work I'm presenting you this evening ranges from museum installations to self-initiated projects in Detroit to a kitchen renovation to furniture made with robots. Um, and to quote Moten and Harney, hapticality, the touch of the undercommons, the interiority of sentiment, the feel that what is to come is here. Hapticality, the capacity to feel through others, for others to feel through you, for you to feel them feeling you. Um, so, and what I'm saying is this might be the architecture that we need. I'm not, I'm not sure if, if, if house opera as an ongoing structure, as an object achieved that, but part of what um, happened when we collaborated with the artists in Detroit was that um, there, were, there were festivals and there were moments, there were events that I think produced that, those haptics. Now I'm gonna shift to uh, black algorithmic thought um, to pick up again on uh, Detroit as, as a location to, to, for, for some of my work um, that I, I think is entering this realm of, of black algorithmic thought. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show you a project for a waterfront neighborhood that I did for the city of Detroit. But to situate this again um, from the undercommons, Moten and Harney say, never being on the right side of the Atlantic is an unsettled feeling. The feeling of a thing that unsettles with others. It's a feeling if you ride with it that produces a certain distance from the settled, from those who determine themselves in space and time, who locate themselves in a determined history. So, I, you know, I think part of that, um, that feeling is something that it's my ambition to be able to work with architecturally. Um, so that architecture does not always have to be stabilizing, does not always have to remind us of a familiar uh, permanent home. Uh, so black algorithmic thought is a way that I'm relating that ambition to technology. This is a, a site near the, uh, the, the, basically this is the Detroit River here um, and a major avenue that goes east to west in Detroit. And what I'm gonna show you is, is a project that it uh, deals with vacancy in a different way, um, where with the house opera, it was that kind of container of the balloon frame house. This is the question of the street, the sidewalk, the open space, grass, um, this, this other kind of material vacancy that um, is proliferated throughout Detroit after these decades of, 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 divest, of disinvestment. So what does black algorithmic thought have to do with this? Um, just let me define that a little bit. Computers and distributed technology are enmeshed in the world and in the work that we have to do together, right? They are the answer, they are not the answer. They are a crucial and often required means to the work when we know what the work is. As Cedric Price said, technology is the answer, now what was the question? There are black people in the future. Blackness is the future of computing. When black people are asking the question, the computation changes. The notion of black algorithmic thought as a continuation of the black radical tradition depends on two key points. One, that the racialization of the world cannot be escaped by computation or subsumed into computation. This lack of escape is not a limitation of our error or even our software engineers, but an aspect of computation itself relating to the notion of the whole thing problem, which goes all the way back to Turing. By that, I mean computers cannot make a world they compute in a world that is already coded in computing. So what I'm, what I'm showing here um, is that part of this project was creating an algorithm that could understand the existing realities on the ground that folks um, had been participating and thriving in and surviving in um, for, for decades while many of the houses were torn down and vacant. And trying to figure out the most basic way how to take a rectangle and turn it into something else. 
Um, and what that something else became was um, actually what you're looking at, um, those meshes are, are not, is not composed. It's, it's basically taking the vacant lots um, that are on the ground in this neighborhood and reducing vertices in a mesh so that these archipelagos appear. Um, and, and so to understand the ways in which that the lot as, as a rectangle, as a parcel, um, could be superseded by a different geometry that might actually be more respectful of the realities on the ground. And so in a way then black algorithmic thought, if we're kind of trying to tie this to a specific architecture is very distinct from the typical building strategy, which would be a parking lot um, and a couple big box retail. Um, part of what then this alternative method that I was putting together for this neighborhood, for the city of Detroit, part of what that opened up was a way in which even new development could learn from the patterns that people lived with on the ground um, throughout these uh, decades of disinvestment. And so rather than just putting big box retail next to a parking lot, then instead um, this pattern of open space and parks was, mi was mixed in with this archipelago, um, learned from this archipelago, um, broke down the scale of housing so that uh, retail, the, the kind of typical sort of anchor could still happen, but not define the entire block and that the, the parking could happen differently. Um, and I want to I want to relate this to a very different scale, which is collaborating with a performance artist and a, and a choreographer. Um, the, the work that I have done at the urban scale um, is by necessity dialogic and, and responsive. Um, but when I work with with artists and when I work with with folks who are asking some of these questions in their own disciplines, I, I continue that that kind of dialogue. Um, and so this is a project with a choreographer named Olivier Terpaga that took place, it started at Princeton in the lab that I direct um, called Black Box Research Group. And it became a dance performance that, that toured around the country, um, I think went to Europe as well. But we started with, he wanted to figure out a way that a material reality could evoke a kind, the, the, the kind of political environment of Burkina Faso, his, his home country, in his father's generation. Um, so we're talking about the 1960s, we're talking about um, uh, the, the independence from a colonial era. And what we started to talk about um, in our dialogue was the, the parallels between uh, the civil rights movement and, and how um, 1968 uh, became a way of reconfiguring so many cities in this country and the, the way that uh, Burkina Faso was experiencing this kind of imaginary of um, independence from colonialism. So I'm going to show you what, what, we, what we ended up with, right? All those ideas had to kind of resolve themselves into an object. And what we ended up with was a brick that's not a brick, um, wood uh, sort of imagining itself as another kind of material logic and, and the dancers um, sort of performing construction. <laughs> Thank you. 
which is sort of how you feel physically in a place and the ways in which, um, you know, atmosphere can be understood in terms of particles, in terms of biology, in terms of mold, in terms of the air we breathe. Um, and so this is, this is my own kitchen in New Jersey that I had to do a rapid rebuild on because it was full of mold and, and everyone in the house, including an infant was getting sick. Um, and so this is the, the sort of moldy kitchen as it, as it, as it arrived. Um, and, and then the, the, the process then was because it wasn't a full renovation. Um, in a way, it sort of continues some of the idea of house opera. What, what can be done to sort of hesitate in the layer of construction, right? And so if you think about um, shelves and, and um, the, what, allows uh, a wall system to be flexible like gallery walls, it's often just having plywood behind the, the drywall, right? That's the secret to, to gallery walls and being able to drill and hang anywhere instead of having to always locate the studs. And so then, so then the, the kitchen itself became, the feeling of it then um, was not so much about the, the visual, um, you know, palette. It was more about not only taking off um, the walls down to the studs to get rid of all the mold, right? But also putting up the walls in a way where if mold did come back, it would be easy to find um, because there's no high tech way of tracking down mold. You really just um, have to have to dig and find it. So, so then the kitchen then um, became uh, plywood sheathed, um, plywood then covered with polycarbonate and basically everything shelves. Um, so that instead of cabinets, then they could be removed, they can be taken to another house or to an apartment even. So it became a kind of flexible system. I want to shift now to air quality in terms of um, a kind of fantasy about air and, and the relationship then between air and these other kind of disasters. Um, this looks like today, right? This looks like 2020, but this is actually a project that I staged in Istanbul in 2016. And it's called Glitter Disaster. And it was um, commissioned by Beatrice Colomina and Mark Wigley for their design by an called Are We Human? And, and I think in a way why it seems projective is because the, the, the concern that I had been developing for air um, and air as, as something that could impact how we feel. Um, it, I was learning from realities on the ground, um, you know, from, from again, the, the air pollution in, in Michigan and the asthma rates. Um, you know, these, these kind of concerns uh, in our environment were, uh, I was starting to, to, to really wonder how can architecture make something like air and our, um, our sort of vulnerabilities? Um, how, can, how can architecture locate uh, any kind of response? And so this was a staging of this question in terms of glitter, glitter as a kind of stand-in for another kind of airborne disaster, glitter as a, as a stand-in for air pollutants, or obviously now we can look at it as a stand-in for uh, you know, viral disasters. And, and this was learning from NASA in their list of plants. This was heavily researched in terms of um, what, what tactics do we even have to, to cope with disasters in the air? And so NASA um, has been developing a list of, of 
um, indoor household plants that remediate the air. Um, you know, there are ways that, that we can borrow from um, space other than um, the, the kind of, the, the, the kind of overscale exploration of another planet, like assuming that this is the planet that we have, um, we, we, we can think about our interior uh, realities, um, you know, through these other kinds of fantasies and experiments, right? Going to the moon um, and, and coming home, we can think of them together. So this did connect to me having done this work. Um, I did feel compelled to respond um, this year with the coronavirus uh, epidemic. I noticed that there was, I mean, it, you know, a shortage of PPE was uh, obvious and it was a, a national uh, crisis immediately, but I noticed that there was a relationship between the kind of materials we were already using for some of our equipment on campus um, in terms of um, the way that I teach building technology, uh, the way that I teach computation on campus is very hands-on um, with uh, thermoforming, not just laser cutting, but also zoomed in, so, so CNC blades. And so because of that, we use a, a, a range of plastics and clear plastics and, and, and exercises that we do. So it occurred to me that we could uh, start to gather some of the, the hacks, basically the PP hacks, PPE hacks, right? Um, the protective, the, the different hacks that people were coming up with to make this protective gear um, and figure out what, what it is that we could produce rapidly. And what emerged was, and, and um, Jenny Sabin was doing this at Cornell in a much more sort of, you know, institutional, heavy duty, heavy resource way. Um, so we started 3D printing what was um, the, the Jenny Sabin sort of recommended rapid PPE for the face shield. But we also noticed that based upon our equipment, um, having this CNC blade that we could do a different approach to the visor um, that didn't involve uh, 3D printing and therefore actually we could produce much faster. Um, and so I started to also get concerned about um, was there a way to um, allow masks to be swapped down and disposable. This was before the disposable masks um, were, were being mass produced. So different ways that um, also this kind of um, the, the, the techniques that we were using could, could also work for, for different kind of face PPE. I want, you know, the, when terms, in terms of the, the feel, um, there's a project that I'm working on that's a commission for a group exhibition that's going to open next year called Reconstructions. And the way that I've approached that project, I think is trying to understand New Orleans is not a site, but a feeling. Um, and so there's 10 architects in that, and we're actually part of a collective called the Black Reconstruction Collective. And each of the 10 of us were working with a different city. And, and so New Orleans, in order to understand New Orleans as a feeling, I knew I needed to collaborate with someone who knows New Orleans a lot better than, than I do. So I ended up collaborating with an artist named Christina K. Robinson. And the first thing that she did, I was looking at the whole country to understand where, where was I going to be working. And um, what you're seeing here is I started to map um, the site for um, 40 acres and a mule, which, which was actually not just an idea, but, um, but, but a spatial reality in terms of after the Civil War. Um, there, there were 40 acre plots in the Carolinas, um, waterfront plots, that um, Black Americans who had gone to the, to the Union um, started to, to occupy, um, but that program obviously was disrupted. So I was kind of thinking about the Carolinas and, and then the Gulf and New Orleans. And when I connected with an artist that I had met in New Orleans, um, she immediately said, first of all, your maps are upside down, right? New Orleans is thinking the South up, right? It's thinking Haiti. It's thinking this geography that you're looking at, but it's, it's thinking it in, through the Caribbean. And so then what I'm working on then for this project um, for MoMA is very much a, a kind of the, the feeling of New Orleans through this character that this artist uh, has, has been developing over the course of the um, past three to five years and a way of thinking New Orleans through a different speculative history, um, thinking of a historical event that's known as the German Coast Uprising of 1811, which is the largest slave rebellion in North America, thinking about how a place would have been shaped if that rebellion had been successful. 
And so then the project enters into um, a speculative history. It enters into working with this character. And it enters then, then the architecture that emerges, and I can only show you a bit of it because um, the, the full exhibit is, is at the museum opening in, in February. And we're not supposed to show you that, that much so that you're enticed to actually come to MoMA and see the rest. But, um, but effectively then the architecture that's emerged is an architecture that is sort of radically not extractive, um, that's building from bamboo, um, that is thinking foundations um, already always with hurricanes. Um, that is that is working with weaving and with concrete as cloth. So it's a mix of materials that we know and also systems that um, we would not uh, associate with, um, with with North America, but that we would associate with, with different scales of making. So now uh, constant recombination um, is something that I, I didn't really orient within this notion of um, the, the haptical, but I think just seeing how materials combine um, in, in some of these, uh, the projects that I'm gonna show you will give you a sense of how, how constant recombination and, and hapticality work together. And just to take a step back, hapticality, which I didn't really define, haptics um, is, is related to the sense of what it is that you touch and feel. Right, so architecture, we often are taught architecture um, in terms of how it's historicized as a, as a visual discipline. What I'm trying to put on the table here is that we can think of architecture as a, as a haptical discipline, right? A discipline that organizes how we feel, how we touch, how materials matter. Um, and so uh, this was a charrette that I did in Pittsburgh a few years ago that was part of a, a series of charrettes um, that I've done called This is What We Will Build When We Get Our Reparations. And a lot of it, I think the haptics here are people sitting around a table making things together. Um, and so it, the, the making things that are constantly recombining. And part of what's getting recombined um, is the, the question, this is what we will build when we get our reparations was, was, was meant literally that, that, that part of what we can do is start to imagine reparations, um, not just ask for them, but already be designing um, in, in expectation of them. And so the designs that people came up with, with just a series of questions and invitation to, to, to combine together, were very speculative. Um, and so there were ideas about remediating the river in Pittsburgh, uh, which has obviously had a lot of heavy manufacturing. There were ideas about protecting certain neighborhoods like the hills in Pittsburgh from gentrification. And, and folks who had worked around these tables um, were invited to, to share not just what they produced, but how they produced it. And part of the, the then recombining was I took agency to then remix um, the, the sort of collages that, that the groups um, produced for their various sites into one large remapping of this, this riverway system. Um, now I'm going to shift scales and show you um, some of the work that I've, I've been doing um, in terms of uh, how we feel uh, in, in, in environments at the scale of the body um, and how we might use design to recombine what we expect bodies to do. And so a lot of that is, is work that I have done at the furniture scale um, where one can ask these questions more directly, maybe. And so this is what you're looking at now is what I call a street wearable table. And, and the pretense here is that if we want to experience uh, space as public, right? One of the, the tropes that we have to do that is the cafe, right? It's going all the way, you know, we can think about the enlightenment and um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a lot of concern in terms of uh, liberal politics around the cafe as a, as a site for people to, to talk politics and read newspapers and engage in a kind of civic discourse. So this project actually came out of my experience in Occupy Wall Street in New York about 10 years ago and, and different experiences I've had in New York where um, public space can be highly controlled and regulated. Um, at the same time, our, our capacity to meet with each other can disrupt those regulations, right? And so I was interested in, could, could you design a piece of furniture that, that participates in something like a protest or a picnic or gathering or just two people having a dialogue 
Um, and so the street wearable table then, it's lightweight, it folds, um, it can be packed up. Uh, and, and that led then to a way of um, working with foam and, and robotics with a similar ambition. Um, this was a, a chair that was commissioned by Storefront for Art and Architecture, where I was thinking about, um, could a chair deliver itself? Could a chair arrive from, from packing materials? And could we think the technology of, of robotics in relationship not always to a kind of um, projective high tech sh shiny sort of future, but also in relationship to um, the, the ways that we, that we sit in our, in our own homes, in our offices, but also um, how we think about our, our grandma's living room. So this is called the hot grandma chair because I was similar to the walls in the kitchen that I showed you, thinking about a thin sheet of plastic and how it changes something from packing material into uh, furniture. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you the video for this. I'll probably skip around because um, you'll, you'll get the idea. So it starts with just this block of foam. Um, and then what you're gonna see is the robotic arms at the Embodied Computation Lab with just a really simple end effector, which is just a, a hot wire. Um, just doing um, just four cuts to turn this um, this cube into into a chair um, that is and, and the cuts being defined somewhat ergonomically and then it, it's called the hot grandma chair because the, that sheet of plastic is evoking um, if if any of your grandmothers had their their sofas wrapped in plastic that that that, that thin sheet of plastic can actually be considered. Um, highly intelligent in terms of the way that we might um, relate to materials over time. In a way, um, the ambition of this furniture um, to, to loop this back to logistics is to, is to think packing furniture differently from Ikea, right? If we could think of it not in terms of always flat and, and effectively disposable, um, but think of the, the, the possibilities of delivering a lightweight piece of furniture that can be customized on, on the other end at any moment in the process and also learning from these, these systems of maintenance that we might know from, from our grandmothers. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start to wrap up um, with this, this notion of, of, of let's go. Um, and I, I guess I, without, without kind of orienting this directly in the, the, the exact language of the undercommons, I think what I want to highlight here is the ways in which hapticality and the kind of fantasy in the midst of logistics can actually encourage us um, and, and be a kind of uh, an architecture of, if not, if not activism, activation. Um, and so, you know, rather than thinking of architecture as purely visual and we're consuming images and in and, and, and architecture kind of locating itself on our Instagram feed, um, pushing the hapticality, um, the, the architecture of feeling in a way into also the political and the civic realm. And so, and so here, I'm gonna conclude with a few projects um, that um, also tie, also kind of go back in, in, my, uh, in my career. Um, I think I'm gonna end with the work that I did at Superfront in Brooklyn, which was setting up a space for um, experimentation and, and questioning what architecture could do. I think it's important to keep questioning what architecture can do. And this is a project from 2015, I think, that as you can see was concerned with removing monuments. Again, it was sort of before that became a national um, discussion around removing monuments. And this is not a Confederate monument here. This is a monument in Times Square, a, a rather anonymous monument, but that was the point. The point was that um, this monument is, is not offensive in terms of its um, historical referent, it's simply in the way. And then being in the way is, 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 is something that we can actually operate on in terms of design, right? We don't always have to be sort of adding a form or 
um, sort of distracting ourselves from what's in front of us. We can, we, can, we can engage through something like an architectural competition in Times Square with not only that kind of Instagram ability, but also the, the kind of presence of people like activists who, who fill up Times Square when a, a national event um, demands our attention. So um, the proposal was also to rename Times, this, it's, not, it's not Times Square, the, the location for this competition that occurs every year around Valentine's Day is, is actually located in Duffy Square, which you probably never heard of, which is this tiny little triangular block. And so the proposal was to rename um, this, this little triangular block Love Square, to remove that statue, and to take this pretense of a, a national competition um, that, that sort of happens every year in this one little block and turn it instead into a, a renaming of a place uh, inspired by the kind of uh, civic participation that has been occurring there. And so in order to do that, um, then to basically remove the statue that was just in the way and had no longer had a, a real relevance for the site. Um, so really the collage is sort of what already happens here and it's just removing um, this, this large statue of this, this person who's not even a nationally recognized figure. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude with um, some of the work that sort of launched me into, um, you know, architecture as a site of haptics, architecture as a, a discipline that can collaborate, architecture as a discipline that, that needs to be in dialogue with other disciplines. And here I'm going to connect this to a, a, a sort of a national question because we are at a moment of, of national questions, um, a question of the imaginary. Um, Eddie Gloud, um, he's got a, a wonderful book on James Baldwin that just came out this year, and he talks about a crisis of imagination that we're having in this country. Um, I would say that this crisis of imagination here, I'm showing you um, a Brooklyn storefront that uh, about 10 years ago, I decided could be a place for architecture to experiment. And folks join me in that. Um, just to talk about imagination in this crisis that Eddie Gloud says we have. I, I would say that this is our domain as architects, as designers, this crisis of imagination. This crisis needs to be taken as seriously as the planetary crisis of climate and our national crisis in evictions and housing precarity. I think to address this crisis, we need to radically change the way architects approach work, both inside ourselves and in the world. We have the tools to imagine radically alternate realities. That is what we do when we do architecture seriously. I think we must create the capacity and the will to imagine radically alternate realities and measure them and assess what it would take to deliver them. Um, so with that, I'm gonna conclude with, and I, and I think I'm doing this partially because um, as students, I hope that you're thinking about what you're gonna do next. Um, and so um, this is 10 years ago before I was teaching, um, when I was working for an architect in New York, um, I was really, open to making mistakes and to collaborating, um, knowing that I would be making mistakes doing that. So I think I wanna end hopefully with, with this notion that in order to um, take on architecture, something that's not just visual, in order to take on architecture, something that can be um, a field where you make things with feeling, where you have feelings, where you're concerned with haptics, where haptics can um, participate in fantasies and also logistics that because that is asking you to do something that um, is not by rote, that it's also asking you to make mistakes, right? And so I think that that's gotta be part of, part of this. Part of the, the goal of Superfront was to create a platform and a venue where the outside world could just uh, just just peek in and see this sort of amazing um, productivity and, and brilliance and cultural criticism that happens in the context of architecture. Superfront is a venue for um, promoting experiments between architects and other disciplines and also for promoting uh, work from emerging architects and also taking those ideas and putting them in a, in a cultural context, especially here in, in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. Superfront really started as an outline for an exhibit and I realized that there was no space to exhibit the kind of show that we were sort of mapping out. I, I was looking for a space where I could really sort of host collaborations and host this, this exhibit 
and I just happened to, to walk here on Atlantic Avenue. I peered through the door and there was a hung ceiling at about eight feet. And it turned out it was um, the office of a sheet metal company that was leaving. But I, I thought there was something really special. Because uh, the space was so poorly used, that the landlord would potentially let me do whatever I wanted. And that's exactly what happened. This is really an opportunity for me to make a lot of mistakes. There aren't that many opportunities um, in, in a professional sense to make mistakes um, in, in architecture. And I think um, it's really important in the process of learning. So, um, so Superfriend is a sort of laboratory for me to make mistakes in terms, of, um, in terms of managing a business, which I think is something that architects tend to do very poorly, which I wanted to learn how to do. In terms of leading, um, in terms of building a staff, inspiring people, in terms of, in terms of marketing and publications. All right. I think I'm gonna end there. Um, I think, oh no, just one other thing I wanna say, um, as far as Superfront, we did these projects involving um, the, the neighbors. And I think one thing that I just wanna conclude with is that you don't need to, to wait, um, you know, to, to do architecture, um, to test out your ideas. I would just encourage you to test them out sooner than you think you're ready to. Um, I would say that's, that's one of the, the, if I can just conclude with anything in this kind of category of let's go, um, that, that really leaning into um, an architecture of hapticality, um, an architecture of feeling. I hope um, to the extent that you're interested in doing that, that it opens up um, a kind of um, uh, more possibilities for, for, for you to do things in a way that um, you're, you're learning as you go. Um, and when you're learning as you go, that you give yourself leeway to do that. Um, so with that, I'm going to conclude the stop share. All right. Wow, okay, wonderful. Professor McEwen, thank you so much for that amazing talk. That was really, really fantastic.